you all uh, very much. Uh, our time is uh, shorter than I would like, so we've got to move swiftly along. We really have, we've all heard about the fiscal cliff facing the federal government. Well, that is creating a fiscal cliff for the federal government's historic role in paying for a lot of transportation infrastructure. And it's not just, a, I'm going I'm to skip this because you'll get all this as, as we go through. I'm going to lay out how this really is affecting things. It's an opportunity to make a major paradigm shift across the board in how we do this stuff. Uh, okay, so first of all, as you know, we've heard some other presentations this weekend. Uh, we have uh, a completely unsustainable, the go federal government is insolvent. Uh, it's not going to go away for the rest of our lives and the lives of many people younger than I. This is going to be the background condition because it's going to take decades to get out of this. Uh, and we're now in a very artificial environment with the interest rates close to zero. You get back, a serious economists who works I've read, when you get back to normal interest rates, probably within the decade, Interest on this now enormous national debt is going to be start getting up into 10, 15, 20 percent of the federal budget. And that is going to squeeze out an awful lot of things that we've taken for granted the federal government does. So the sequester, there is a sequester. I mean, they only pushed it off March 1st. The sequester, by law now, unless Congress changes the law, uh, kicks in, cutting 8 percent round numbers of defense uh, budget for the current year and about 6.9 percent of uh, non-defense discretionary budget. Not a, not a, nothing at all about entitlements, but all the other stuff. And that is going to, that, that's the first, I predict, of many such sequesters, many such across the board cuts we're going to be seeing. Uh, there will be no more general fund government money for all kinds of things some people consider nice to have, like high speed rail and so forth, but an awful lot of other things too. Now, this be, if the federal government's role is reduced, the states are going to have to presumably do more, but can they pick up the slack? Can they invest more in transportation infrastructure? Well, they all have balanced budget requirements, but those are based on cash accounting. They don't, they're not generally accepted accounting principles accounting, and so the budget conditions of state governments is way, far worse than it looks like uh, at the outset. Uh, Richard Ravitch and Paul Volcker uh, did this report, which has gotten almost no attention, the State Budget Crisis Task Force report, that really, in stark terms, outlines how bad off thing the state government budgets really are. Medicaid expansion is a huge looming threat. They already have massive pension overhangs that we've heard talk about. And they consistently use budget gimmicks like Jerry Brown does in California to disguise the true nature of, of, of what the situation is. So it's difficult to, the states are simply not going to have money available to make up for cutbacks uh, in federal money. So we have this project underway now that uh, we released a report uh, uh, in January uh, that we decided to do last September when we saw this coming uh, on a program for using this, taking advantage of Rahm Emanuel's uh, never let a crisis go to waste. This is a major crisis facing all of transportation uh, and we are going to, we're starting taking a clue, a cue from the Simpson Bowles Commission report, which, whose report so far has been ignored, saying, look, Infrastructure really is important. I mean, we may not be investing wisely in it now, but we need more sound investment. And so, and Clinton, Clifton Simpson Bowles Commission said, look, the way to protect infrastructure from these cross the board cutbacks is to make it 100% supported by user fees so that the user fees are not subject to cross the board government cutbacks. And that, we're taking that to heart. The current federal role for all of these transportation things is they have user taxes of a different kind for each mode. Uh, they put the money into, they count for it as a federal trust fund for that particular mode. And then the Congress appropriates money out of that money each year, plus some general fund money usually. And of course, you put all kinds of conditions and strings attached to any federal dollar. One dollar of federal money balloons your costs uh, uh, way higher than it would be otherwise. Now, there's a, a trust fund, one trust fund for airports and airways, another trust fund for highways and transit, another trust fund for port maintenance, and another trust fund for inland waterways. You probably didn't even know that, right? Uh, but we've got them all, and they're all bad. Uh, they're all in trouble. Uh, so the flaws, this model is inherent. I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, user taxes, trust fund to protect the money. This is how we built the interstate highways. But what it's become from politics over the years is just a mess. 
Uh, first of all, uh, these user taxes are not like your electric bill, which goes to the electric company directly, and they use it to fund bonds for, big, for new power plants and stuff. No, this, they're, they're still taxes, and because they're taxes, Congress is very reluctant to increase the rates when there's a genuine need for more investment, because it's a tax increase. People don't distinguish that it's a user tax and it only goes for that. So that makes it hard. We have a chronic problem of not enough good investment going on. There's an awful lot of redistribution because this is all done by political things. Redistribution from users who pay the user taxes to non-users like transit riders. Uh, a third of your gas taxes, federal gas taxes, go for non-highway purposes. Uh, transit, bike paths, all this kind of nonsense that's politically attractive to members of Congress. Uh, it distorts investment because uh, uh, the decisions that are made with a lot of this money are made by pol what's, what's politically most advantageous, not what produces the best return on investment. So we have a lot of distorted investment in infrastructure. When we, that's exactly what we don't need. We need to put it all to the highest and best use. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the large added costs. One dollar of federal money means you have to comply with the Davis-Bacon Act and pay union prevailing wages, the Buy America Act, all kinds of minority and women business set-asides and so forth. So it increases the cost by anywhere between 10 and 20 percent uh, of your total project if there's any federal money in it and you have to have all those things. There's no pricing uh, in all these things, uh, no pricing in air traffic control, no pricing on highways except for a few toll roads, no pricing uh, on the waterways, no pricing in the harbors. So you have congestion, you have misallocation again. And really important point. All this capital investment that, that is done by federal and state user tax money is all cash basis investing. It's not financed in the way you do when you, when you take out a mortgage to acquire your house or when a business uh, uh, issues uh, revenue bonds uh, like electric utility does to, uh, buy a, to build a new power plant and then it's paid for over time as people enjoy the benefits of it and pay their bills. That's not the model we use in all this. So this is all an extremely distorted model for how to do this stuff. So our challenge and in this report and in all the stuff that we're doing is to rethink this model that's been used for 50, 60 years. And first premise is we've got to sort out what's truly should be the federal government. We have a system of federal, state, and local governments. What uniquely should the federal role be in this, and what's properly the state and local government decision-making role, not necessarily providing, but making the decisions and deciding what things get done and what things don't. Second principle is to shift from user taxes to user fees where it's like a utility bill. You pay it to the provider of the infrastructure, and then they can uh, leverage that. They can raise, issue bonds and so forth that are, that are paid uh, to, to do the investments. Shift, for, as I said, then from funding to financing for the large projects. Uh, and then funding to financing sounds just like a word change. But if you have to finance it, you have to go to the capital markets. And you have to meet a market test. Is this really a sound? What's the likelihood that the people who put up the money are going to get paid back? There has to be a sort of a, a pretty reliable funding mechanism built in there, generally from user uh, uh, payments, utility bill type payments, in order for the project to get fin financed. And if it can't, it's probably not a project that we should be investing in in the first place. And this is radically different from what's done in all these areas today, for the most part. Uh, and there's a big opportunity to expand the private sector's role because uh, revenue bonding and, and uh, uh, a reliable stream of user payments lends itself very much to long-term public-private partnerships there, where you can bring in a true market player to run uh, infrastructure, uh, big infrastructure uh, assets as businesses. So let's, let's just quickly take a look at a few of these areas. Of all these areas that do get federal money, airports are the most market-based of the group. Uh, first of all, they, they charge their customers. Airlines pay landing fees and they pay uh, space rentals, and that's a big source. That's the main source of, of airport revenue. Passengers at most airports uh, pay a passenger facility charge between three dollars and four dollars and fifty cents per uh, per trip, uh, per one-way trip. Uh, and those are, those are bondable against, and the airports do bond against them uh, to issue airport revenue bonds. And this is a, very much like a business would do. Uh, federal grants are actually a small part of the budget for large airports and medium airports, which together handle about 85 to 90 percent of all the passenger volume. The small airports are much more dependent on, on, on federal grants. But for the vast majority of us travelers, um, these airports could be completely self-supported. The federal grants could become irrelevant. 
Uh, so our proposal is that we end all, uh, we end federal grants for all passenger airports, including the small ones, because they would just need to charge higher passenger facility charges and maybe make their landing fees a little more realistic. Uh, remove the limits that the federal government, Congress imposes limits at the behest of the airlines on the passenger facility fees. But the trade-off would be we can lower the, uh, uh, the ticket tax uh, uh, on the one side, and on the other side, let the airports sell fund. I mean, it's a, it's a and I'm, I've, I've managed to sell this to Grover Norquist as a, a devolution of the federal, shrinking the federal role. And this is a sea change because uh, Grover Norquist and, and his organization and NTU have historically always bought into the airport airline, the airline's propaganda line that the federal limit on the passenger facility charge is actually uh, 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 protecting the people from a federal tax increase. It's completely backwards, but Congress always falls for that. So uh, we, may, we may change it this time. And remove the limits on airport privatization. Air traffic control, you know, I've given talks on that at Reason Weekend. This is another thing that it, it is largely the dollars coming in in your ticket taxes uh, pay for most of the cost of running the air traffic control system. But this is such a mess of a big bureaucracy that's trying to run a high-tech service business and is just very poorly suited to the task. So we need, and our proposal, which we've been making in various forums for over 20 years is to separate the air traffic control operation from the FAA. FAA should be a safety, just a safety regulator of aviation. That's a big enough job for it to do. Uh, shift to direct user fees for, uh, for air traffic control, which would enable the spun off, preferably nonprofit corporation to issue revenue bonds to pay for the $20 billion modernization that they're trying to do now out of annual operating cash flow appropriated by Congress, with Congress making a lot of priorities as to what they should spend it on. Uh, have arms like safety regulation and so forth. Highways, uh, as I mentioned, the Highway uh, Trust Fund was originally set up as a pretty good user financing, user funding mechanism for building the interstate highway system. But once it was, the original plan was largely built out, Congress says, oh, well, we have this great revenue stream. What else can we do with it? Well, we can give them grants for their state highways. We can give them grants for transit. That happened under Ronald Reagan, by the way, uh, the, uh, opening it up for transit funding. Uh, so today, 100% of uh, money, the federal highway gas taxes, comes from automobiles and trucks, but only 70% uh, of it actually is spent on highways. The other 30% is all these other non-highway transportation stuff, mostly urban transit. So we propose rethink the federal role, make it the interstate routes only, which is the actual interstate highways and some of the others that are called national highway system that, that are, many of them should be upgraded to interstates. Uh, remove the federal restrictions that are imposed on states that prevent them from using tolling. So give the states tools to cope with the bigger responsibility of being responsible for all the rest of the highway system. And, uh, and build up support for the concept of highways as a network utility that's paid for directly by their users. Uh, so for transit, what happens to transit then if the feds, feds are no longer providing it? Well, the situation with transit is that 100%, you know, when people ride Washington Metro and you know, buy their tickets and so forth, 100% of the capital costs of building transit systems, buying buses, is paid for by subsidies, um, uh, by federal subsidies, state subsidies, and local subsidies. Uh, the fare box uh, pays for anywhere from 10% to maybe 50% of the operating cost, just the operating cost of a transit system. And this is true across the United States. And so, uh, and also by getting free federal money if you want to build uh, capital projects means that it biases the decision away from inexpensive things like better bus systems and toward capital intensive things. If the feds will pay for half of the cost of a new light rail line, wouldn't you rather have a light rail line, even if it doesn't make any economic sense? It's glitzy, you can cut a ribbon on it. You say, we're a modern, we're a world-class city now because we have a light rail line. So it biases decisions uh, in all the wrong ways against what's cost effective. So our solution, devolve it to urban governments, say, look, sink or swim, guys, that will mean they will reduce costs by switching mostly to bus rapid transit instead of rail. Uh, they will contract out service. Uh, the places that do it now save 30 to 35 percent on the cost of running bus routes and increase revenues. They could charge market rate based fares on all these nice subway systems and the light rail of people who use the few people who use them, charge market-based rates except for poor people and give them transit vouchers. And you could probably double the revenue of a transit system by doing that. So reduce the cost, increase the revenues. Uh, ports, and this is, you probably have never heard of any of this, but uh, 
we have this thing called the harbor maintenance tax. It's a, a user tax that uh, every, every cargo uh, ship that's unloaded in a U.S. port coming from abroad pays a percentage of the value of the cargo. Now, why that? Who knows? But the, that goes into the harbor maintenance trust fund, an account in the federal government that is for, ha for harbor dredging. And, uh, and the uh, ports put in requests, and the Army Corps of Engineers has to do big study. And, and uh, Congress every year well, appropriates money, but the amount they appropriate every year is only about half of what comes in in the harbor maintenance tax because OMB likes to hoard that money so that it makes the federal budget deficit look smaller. This used to happen with the Aviation Trust Fund and of the highway, and that, that Congress got rid of that eventually, but it still happens with harbor. But the biggest flaw is that ports all compete with one another. All the West Coast ports compete with one another. The West Coast ports compete with the Gulf and the East Coast ports. So why should the federal government be picking winners and losers? And why should the ports that have naturally deep harbors, like Oakland, Los Angeles, uh, Seattle, Norfolk, uh, that don't need dredging or need very little, be paying money for harbor dredging to help their competitors? And yet they do it, because that's the system that they all figure, well, we better, we're better off together in the American Association of Port Authorities, all singing from the same hymn book, uh, than to uh, uh, maybe have some ports have to go out of business because <laughs> they just aren't competitive. Uh, so our proposal is to abolish the harbor maintenance tax and the harbor maintenance trust fund because ports can naturally self-fund. Port of Miami is actually doing that now so they can dredge to 50 feet to uh, meet the larger ships because they're not sure they're going to get their federal money. And if they wait, it may be 10 years until they get it. So uh, they're, they're issuing bonds and doing it themselves. Finally, inland waterways. Uh, you know, we have this whole huge network, you know, on the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, and so forth. Uh, barge operators uh, pay a user tax on diesel fuel. Uh, it goes into a trust fund for uh, maintaining and improving the inland waterway system. The user tax only covers 8% of the total cost of operating and maintaining and improving the waterways. The main biggest expense, dredging is one expense. The other is uh, the locks and dams are mostly obsolete and they're not big enough. They're in poor shape and so forth. And again, Congress doesn't appropriate enough money uh, because most of it has to come out of the general fund. And that is just clearly gone, you know, going to be gone very soon. We're not going to have it. So our proposal, and this, is actually, this has actually been suggested in a report, the Army Corps of Engineers has a little research institute, and they've sort of looked at the future of this about a year ago, and they said, well, there may, we may have to really change the model here, and one of the alternatives could be to have uh, individual waterways developed in some kind of a user pay mechanism that would pay for at least most, they say most, we say all, of the costs of rebuilding the locks and dams and so forth. And, uh, and have lock fees as a bondable revenue stream, but do it quarter by quarter, uh, and each one be, could be kind of a self-governing thing. And there's actually a little bit of traction for that idea uh, now, because people can, the, the smarter ones that can look further ahead can see the handwriting on the wall and say this, this system is not going to be sustainable in the way we've had it for the past 40 or 50 years. So now one thing also, Public-private partnerships, uh, you know, we've seen this. Reason has played a big role in introducing long-term PPPs for highway projects, such as the Capitol Beltway. If you've been to Washington recently, they just opened in the fall. There's finally expressed toll lanes on a major portion of the uh, Capitol Beltway around Washington, D.C. It's a huge, huge improvement. It's, it's done by a 70-year toll concession, entirely at risk by the private sector. If, uh, if not, not enough people use them and are not willing to pay the rates that they need to do, the variable toll rates to keep traffic flowing at 50, 60 miles an hour, then they're at risk. And uh, there's no taxpayer, the taxpayers are not at risk in this. Um, so there's a whole lot of things we can do with this model applied, not only highways, express line networks, airport terminals, LaGuardia Airport, they're, they're planning to do this for the new central terminal. The RFP is going to be out uh, in a few months. Uh, we can pay for air traffic control modernization this way, dredging harbors and channels, new, t new terminals at ports. There's a lot of opportunities for using this model. It's very well suited once you have financing and once you have true user fees uh, in place. Now, some people can say, well, the government can do all this. Airports are ready. Airports are all government owned. They're already doing this. That's true. So what value it does, and we have toll road agencies in many states that about a third of the states have toll road. What does the private sector add to what you could do with a government authority. Well, 
risk transfer is a big one uh, because the taxpayers are ultimately backstopping the government airport authorities and, and toll agencies. Uh, in, the, in the long term properly structured PPP, only the investors are at risk for that and that's a big difference. Mega projects, you know, billion dollar scale projects have a very bad track record, the big dig in Boston, anybody remember, of mad, big cost overruns, late completion, over optimistic forecasts of how many people are using it and how much they'll pay for it and so forth. So risk transfer is a huge advantage of PPPs. Guaranteed long term maintenance. Um, the people who finance these projects, um, the first thing they look at is, you know, because you're expecting to attract people to pay user fees, uh, is, it gonna be, is there a guarantee that it's going to be properly maintained for the entire lifetime of the thing? And so that is, that is true in these kinds of arrangements. You, you have to guarantee, you have to prove to the investors that they'll be properly maintained for the entire period out of the user fee revenues in order to get the money in the first place. Now, the additional investment, we have globally over the last decade, there's infrastructure investment funds that have amassed over $200 billion dollars to invest in infra not just transportation infrastructure and not just in the U.S. worldwide, but electric utilities, transmission lines, uh, water systems, but also airports, toll roads, and so forth. So there's a lot of capital. So it's a new source of not just debt. The public sector does things with a, when they do these these things, they do it 100 percent debt. We have a new source that can equity typically is 20 to 25 percent of the of the capital costs of these projects, and so that's a whole new jump starting of, of more investment. But it would be sound investment because you have all the safeguards for selecting what kind of projects to do, and innovation. Now, I don't have time to give you a lot of examples, but we've already seen in, in the toll road area um, big invest big innovations that the private sector has come up with that state DOTs had not thought of would have seen as too risky if they had thought of them. Uh, too much risk of political bite, biting them in the back for taking a, a risk, so forth. So what we are doing is to wrap up, uh, we first of all last month issued this policy study which is aimed primarily at the fiscal conservatives in Congress to open their eyes to a different way of doing things. And we're planning to give briefings and the Republican study committee and groups like that. Uh, it's gotten a lot of play already in the transportation news media. We have a major project that's underway that I mentioned at last year's recent weekend that we're making progress on to develop a political coalition in favor of an air traffic control corporation. We're working with the main trade association for airports, the Airport Council International, on a, a defederalization plan whereby the airports, at least the large and medium ones, are willing to give up their airport grants, their federal grants, in exchange for the ability to self-fund with a, with a higher, basically unlimited passenger facility charge, whatever, whatever it needs to be to replace the federal grants. Um, we have, uh, we've worked with, during last year's highway bill reauthorization, and we're continuing to work with a tolling coalition that wants to remove the federal ban on using tolls on the interstate system, not to put a toll booth on existing unimproved things, but rather to finance the re rebuilding and modernization as the interstate system is where interstates are over the next 20 years, most of them, almost all of them that were built in the, in the 60s and 70s will exceed their 50 year original design life. Most of them are obsolete in terms of design. They don't have enough lanes. They have bottleneck interchanges. It's a massive project, and we have a big study underway on that, and we're working with the Interstate Tolling Coalition and the Toll Roads Trade Association on that. Uh, uh, our newest analyst, Baruch Feigenbaum, is working on, on some interesting things on rethinking, uh, you know, fresh ideas on urban transit. We're working with Sam Staley, former Reason uh, uh, mem team member now at Florida State University, who's getting, believe it or not, Rockefeller Fund grants for outside the box thinking on urban transit. And so we're doing some neat things there. And we're uh, increasingly critiquing the status quo on, on ports and waterways. And because and, those things are up for reauthorization this year in Congress. And we're going to try to make a big thing out of that. So to wrap up, our message to the transportation world and to policymakers, the old era that we've known for 50 years of federal user, ta user taxes and trust funds is dying. It's not, cannot be sustained in the era that we're now entered of downsizing the federal government and getting its fiscal house in order. We need to shrink the federal role, and that means the states are gonna to need to do more, be responsible for more. And uh, so user taxes will need to be phased out and user fees, direct user fees phased in. And uh, uh, 
we're going to be pushing hard across the board in all of these areas for the principles of true user fees that are paid to the operator, not to the government, uh, for financing projects uh, uh, going to the capital markets and, uh, and having to meet a market test for deciding which investments in ports, which investments in waterways, which investments in highways actually make sense and are sustainable. And, uh, and that means, of course, then expanding the role of uh, PPP concessions. And with that, I think I've, Amy, I've met your target for uh, 15 minutes for questions. Thank you.